Welcome to Impostrix Podcast, where we affirm the lived experiences of professionals of color who navigate imposter syndrome and racial toxicity at work. The tools that you learn here will help you confidently address racial toxicity at work, put that imposter syndrome to the side, stand in your power, and resist racial gaslighting. I'm your host, Whitney Knoxley, a Black mother to Black boy children, a civil rights attorney, and an anti-racism educator and trainer. If this is your first time listening, welcome. We're glad you're here. Episodes are published every week. Make sure you go back and listen to our past episodes. All right, here we go. Hey, friends. This is another bonus episode in between seasons one and two. We will restart with season two in February. Until then, I am re-releasing some episodes, and today's episode is something special. It's timely. It is an episode that I recorded back in the fall of 2023 with Dr. Katie Acosta. Dr. Acosta is a professor and scholar at Georgia State University, and that conversation was all about how Black women and other people of color are navigating academia. So, as you can guess, it is a very timely considering all we've seen and watched and held space for regarding Dr. Claudine Gay's resignation from Harvard University as president. I shared in last week's episode that I was feeling some kind of way. I've had time now to reflect a little bit on that and learn a little bit more for myself about why I was feeling so triggered. And what it comes down to is it's happened to me. Um, Of course, I've not been president of Harvard University. I've not been the first Black female president of really anything. I've not been scrutinized on the world stage for positions that I took or for actions that I may or may not have taken. But I have certainly been in environments where people with more power than me did not like what I had to say, did not like what I stood for, were not aligned with my values, but could not really fire me because of those things or could not really like push me from the space because of those things. So then just found something else, just found something else. And um, that was that. So I'm triggered because those are hurtful experiences. I've experienced them in a variety of settings. This is not new for Black women. This is something that many of us experience on more than one occasion. And um, it's painful to see it happening to someone who has excelled to such heights. Um, I've seen a lot of comments on social media um, to summarize, you know, what's happened. And and one of them that really resonated with me was, you know, Black excellence won't save you. And Karian Suarez in episode 19 said something similar that, um, well, it wasn't similar, but along the same lines around like assimilation won't save us. I'm not saying that Black excellence is assimilation, but it just reminds me of some of these truths that I think we hold in communities of color where if we attain a certain level, if we assimilate enough, if we straighten our hair enough, if we get enough degrees, then we will be accepted. We will be treated like a white man. We ain't never going to be treated like a white man. And so the question that a lot of us are thinking when we consider what happened with Dr. Claudine Gay is not whether or not she did these things, not whether or not she should have stood firmer at the congressional hearing or whatever. Our thought is, but would a white man have been treated that way? So look. I congratulate Dr. Gay for taking the step back that she needed to take. And um, I appreciate the example that she gave us because that's validation for me. So we are going to listen to this episode. And now after, you know, experiencing what we've all or witnessing, I guess, what we've all witnessed with Dr. Gay, I think this conversation about how Black women are treated in academia will have a different kind of um, meaning for us. and maybe 
will provide additional context for now thinking about what Dr. Gay has gone through. So that's that. We're going to jump right into the episode. Before we do, a couple of things that I wanted to share. One is that I still have the Working Within Your Values Toolkit that is available to you. All you need to do is find the link in my episode description. The second thing is I have created a Patreon. And um, it feels kind of weird. It feels kind of weird. I'm not going to lie. So what a Patreon is, is an opportunity for super fans of Impostrix Podcast to make a monthly donation. I will be providing my Patreon subscribers with behind the scenes episodes with specially created for you videos sharing my reactions and my reflections on some of the episodes and topics that we discuss on Impostrix Podcast. And we'll also have some freebies available for you. So if you're interested in that, you can also find the link in the show notes. All right, here we go with the episode. I'm here today with Dr. Katie Acosta, who is a professor at Georgia State University. Um, we go back a little bit, um, and I really enjoy my conversations with Dr. Acosta. So um, I'm looking forward to having her on the show. I'm going to have her introduce herself, and then we'll get started. So Katie Who are you? What are your identities? What perspective are you coming to us today with? Okay. Thank you so much, first of all, for inviting me to be on the Impostrix podcast. I think it's awesome. And thank you for doing this for all the Black women out there who really need it. So um, that's totally awesome. So yeah, um, my identities. So I am an academic. I have been for a long time. There are these letters at the end of my name. Sometimes people call me Dr. Acosta. Um, And so I do see myself as my work identity as a professor as a really important part of who I am. But there's so much, you know, that really matters to me totally separate from who I am as an employee at Georgia State where I work. I am the daughter of immigrants. I am a Dominican woman. I am Afro-Latina. I am queer identified. I am a mother of two amazing children. Um, And all of these things matter to me so very much and so personally that I feel like by the time I start thinking about myself as someone who Uh, has a career and does a job that I care about, I have brought so much with me um, to get to that place that matters to me and that informs the work that I do in the academy all the time. Yeah. So how do your identities inform your work? Because this is one of the things that I think, especially early on, I struggled with is like feeling like I needed to separate my identities from how I show up in the workplace and basically being unsuccessful at doing that (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, and just like giving it up to the point where now, of course, I embrace, you know, all of who I am and um, the lens that I come to my work with is very much, you know, all of my experiences, my my history, um, my family history is present in conversations that I'm having with people um, and as I'm doing my advocacy. So how, how does it show up for you in your work? Yeah. When I first became an academic, I had just entered graduate school. I decided I wanted to get this PhD, but I didn't fully understand what I was, what it meant. I did not understand the world that I was entering into. Um, And so I didn't give a lot of thought to separating my identities at that very young age. I think I was still pretty naive about what what that would mean. Mm -hmm. Um, But I learned very, very quickly. I mean, I was in a graduate program where I was the only Black student for the first three or four years. I was the only Black student in the program. Um, And there were some international students, and I quickly learned that this this is the academy that it is a deeply deeply white space mm-hmm. um and that the you know department i was entering was no different than the rest i had a lot to unpack with that in and of itself 
I think I spent a lot of time trying to contort myself to be a specific version of scholar that um, I was being trained to be um, that really never fit me very well at all. I think in my earliest years, I was ashamed of being a first generation scholar. I felt like I didn't know anything and I felt like I really needed to catch up, like I was constantly catching up. And it took quite a while for me to like begin to shed that, that layer, which really hampered me for a long time. But, you know, I'm a sociologist. And so like I, what I do for work is I study our social world. And I was always from the beginning very interested in research on race, gender and sexuality. Um, and so I entered the scholarship because of who I am not being able to be separated, you know, being separated from the work that I do. So much about my life and my life's experiences has really informed the direction that my work has taken, what I've been interested in studying, and the angle that I take when I look at the work itself. So earlier I, in my career, I was just self-conscious of it. And now I'm just very unapologetic about it. Mm-hmm. And it's just taken a really long time to get there. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and, pain. <laughs> yeah. I, I can begin to imagine, you know, we, we have different identities and different, you know, backgrounds and experiences, of course. Um, and you had said something at the beginning about being, you know, the only Black person, um, the only Latina in your program. And then the feeling of you had to catch up. And I can relate to that so deeply, uh, the feeling of like, I almost like my inherent knowledge, my inherent power, all of the stuff that I do come with doesn't matter because it doesn't look like whatever our white space is valuing at this given moment. Mm -hmm. And for me, like when I get down to nuts and bolts about it, it showed up for me in my writing and in how I talk. I write as if I'm speaking and that's not okay. Yeah. Um, (laughs) That is not okay. But for me, that's how I communicate. Um, I am a very you know, laid back person, which in like professional worlds, what that means is that I'm not formal in my communication. Um, And if I'm not formal in my communication, then, you know, are people looking at me as if I'm just not educated? I don't know what I'm talking about. Like the ways that how we communicate can be, um, I don't know, interpreted as a not knowing. Sure. And so I just remember for me really early on, um, you know, that. And then it also, this took me way back to high school. My freshman year in high school, I went to a Catholic school. Um, it was my first time in a Catholic school. Um, but in Catholic schooling, uh, people like matriculate through the Catholic schools, similar like to neighborhood schools where you go to one Catholic grade school and then you go to the Catholic middle school and then you go to the Catholic high school. So um, all of these people that I was going to class with, they were white, but they were also people who had like grown up together in these schools and learned about these various different religious um, groups and all this stuff. And um, I remember I was asked to read aloud from the textbook and what I read aloud, the word that I used was protestants because (laughs) where I'm coming from is protest. Yeah, yeah. The word was Protestant. (laughs) Protestant. I see that. (laughs) folks started laughing so hard at me, and I had no idea why, Um, because I'm not, my brain isn't thinking about religious groups or, you know, any of this stuff. Like, I'm coming from a place of, I know this word, it's protest, because in my culture, in my community, like, this is something that we talk about a lot. I had very active parents. I was a very active child in social movements, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I felt so dumb. Like, so I was mortified. 
I was more to the point where I'm talking about it today. You know, this was <laughs> now 20 years ago. Um, and I, I'm talking about it today. So I, I just say all that to say that I, yeah, yes to what you're saying. <laughs> I'm so sorry you had that experience. <laughs> And I, I can totally relate to it, too. I mean, I can think of so many instances early in life where I had this kind of like there was this clear moment where I, I'm realizing I'm not getting it. like everyone else has a certain capital that I, I don't I don't have. And I wouldn't have even known to call it capital then. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, part of what I appreciate about the Academy is it's gifted me language to understand inequality and how it's impacted my life. I didn't know I was going to get that from the career that I chose, but because I'm a sociologist and because I study inequity so broadly, it's helped me like make sense of all of my like past experiences. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's tough to understand these things so intimately and then live with them. Partly, sometimes I wish I could just be a little bit more ignorant because I don't know. I feel like sometimes that can be a little, there's, that can be more blissful. Exactly. <laughs> I yeah. can't ignore things sometimes, you know. Yeah, and particularly when you look like how you or I look, that can get us in trouble. In yeah. well, trouble with quotation marks. And I'm the same way. Like I can't unsee something. You know, I'm a see something, do something, say something. You know, and I. It's hard to roll that back when you're in an environment that doesn't welcome it. Mm -hmm. um, and then I feel like it's my responsibility, you know, to, to do something about the inequality that I see or the inequity that I see, um, which isn't always great in our workplaces. That's not always what, what folks want. Folks want you to show up and do, do the thing, uh, spend <laughs> your entire life doing the thing. Yes. <laughs> So today we're going to talk about the Academy as you call it. Is that what it's called? That's what you guys call it, the Academy. I call it just higher education. But higher ed. I'm the same thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just making sure we're talking about the same thing. We are. <laughs> um, and specifically what we're going to talk about is the, the pattern that you're seeing and that's happening of women – faculty of color and black faculty leaving the academy to do other things. And so I first want to ask, because I'm not in higher ed, I need some clarification as to what are the different positions within faculty, like status, if you will, because I've heard tenured, I've heard adjunct, I've heard just full time, I've heard associate professor. So what are all of these roles? Yeah. So when people earn a PhD, you enter into the professoriate, right? And you can do it many different ways. If you go right into um, the most stable of academic positions, then you would start out as an assistant professor. Those turn into tenured professors um, down the road. At most institutions, people stay assistant professors for the first six years. Um, you go up for promotion, and if you are promoted, you become an associate professor. <clears throat> and then you can stay at the associate professor level until you and your institution believe that you're prepared to go up for what we call full professor. At that point, we just use the term professor, we drop the pre descriptors mm -hmm. and you're just professor at that point. Um, that's like the, the, the three tiers of the, of the hierarchy. Okay. There are postdocs, postdoctoral fellows where people begin their um, at different points in their career, either when they're first starting or at other points in their career can do like they can leave a tenure track position or before starting a tenure track position, they can do some sort of postdoctoral program where they are working as professors and as researchers outside of that three-tier model that I just described. And then there are adjunct professors. And adjunct professors are individuals who are teaching on a per-course basis mm -hmm. as needed by the institution. Mm -hmm. okay. In general, what we've seen in higher education is that the number of tenure-track professors, those would be those that fall into the assistant associate full model, that the number of 
professor positions in that track are drastically going down at institutions throughout the country. More and more universities are relying on adjunct professors much more heavily. Some institutions, even more than 50% of the professors Mm. at their institutions are adjunct professors, which leaves very few professors who are um, on this tenure track model. And so the positions are disappearing. What does tenure get you? I mean, is that like, (laughs) why do I want tenure? It's a great question. Um, So I used to think that having tenure meant that you would be in a position where you would have job security indefinitely. A lot of people um, describe tenure as a process where you can't get fired. That's not accurate. um, But (laughs) just for the record, (laughs) just for the record, especially not in the state of Georgia, which is another conversation. Yeah. But Um, It does mean that your institution has decided that you are worth the long-term commitment, that they are going to continue to keep you. You're not concerned about um, losing your job overnight, if you will. And then what's, how does somebody get there? What's the process? Mm -hmm. So getting tenure um, varies based on the kind of university that you're at. Mm -hmm. I have spent all of my career at research institutions. And so part of getting tenure for me has always been conducting research and publishing, building your national reputation. These are all things that matter at at research institutions Um, to the extent that you can build a name for yourself in your field as a scholar doing a specific kind of work, then your institution feels more of an incentive to invest in you in that way. Mm. And so then eventually you get tenure or you don't. Part of the reason why so many people leave is because after those six years, they they do not get tenure. This happens and it happens quite a bit for black women. Yeah. I mean, Um, it sounds, I don't like how this, I want to shake this off. I don't, I don't think I like how this. (laughs) It's toxic. (laughs) I don't think I like how this sounds because it mm-hmm. sounds to me like we we do our research, which of course y'all like research. That's why you're you're in the thing. But isn't like how research gets published and how your research gets funded and pe- the peer review process and who's reading and who's looking and who cares? Like, isn't that highly highly like prejudicial and like a very subjective? Maybe I shouldn't use prejudicial, even though that's what it is. But it's subjective, right? It- it is. It, it truly is. Um, there are so many factors that impact, you know, the a level of success that you as a scholar are able to have with the work that you do. Um, and I'm reminded all the time that academia is a white institution and that it was created that way. It was never created to have or create space for mm. Black women. Yes. Right. That was never the goal. And I'm reminded of this all the time because there are so many different structures that are inherently set up to promote racial bias. Um, Bias in certain kinds of research, for instance, you know, the outlets that you have available to you to publish as a scholar, as someone who does the kind of work that I do, the outlets open to me for publishing as a race scholar, as a, as a scholar who does queer studies work. Like Ooh, I don't hey, have anyone to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> there aren't as many venues, you know? Yeah. So that in itself creates a huge problem in terms of getting your work out there. Mm-hmm. But if I have four places to get my work out there and the white man down the hall in my office has 25 places and how, you know, what do you think, how's that going to go? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, The other thing is that an essential part of the process for becoming a tenured professor is you have to be able to get people in the field to vouch for you. Mm, Okay. And they have to be people who are are at a more senior rank and who understand your discipline and your substantive area, but who are not close to you. They can't be co-authors with you. They can't be someone you have a relationship with. That's so it has to be. So they're just a random person that you hope is like for you. That you hope will read your work, appreciate it, 
and will speak about it kindly to the university. And you never and you never know who they are. I'm not gonna lie. I just I don't love it. I don't love this. (laughs) I don't love this either. It's just so messed up. Um But one of the places in where we see particularly women of color struggle with the tenure process is they struggle with getting people to speak on their behalf. They struggle with getting more senior scholars to say, I know that book that that junior scholar wrote. I use it in my course. I definitely will write a letter for that person. They struggle to have that kind of endorsement. And without that kind of endorsement, none of us get tenure. Um, and there are many reasons why sometimes they struggle with that, with getting that kind of endorsement. First of all, it's not just that, you know, being a black woman in the academy is, you know, we are few and far between. It's also that the substantive areas that we study are going to be studied by fewer people to begin with, which means Mm -hmm. that there's a smaller pool to pick from. Mm -hmm. And then those of us who are being asked to do these endorsements are asked disproportionately over and over again, and we're exhausted. And so, you know, if there are 10 people throughout the country growing up for tenure at the same time, and they are um, in my area, I'll get asked to do all 10 of those endorsements Mm. because there are very few senior people who Mm. could do it. And I imagine that's a lot of work. It's a ton of work. I mean, I can't just write like a recommendation letter. No, I mean, you can write a recommendation letter after you read six years of their life's oh efforts. It's, it's a ton of work. And so the inequities compound to make it more difficult, particularly for Black women, to remain in the academy. If you get in here at the tenure track level to remain here post-tenure, it's no joke. You had said something that I just so relate to. And that's this idea that the profession that you're in was not made for you. Like Mm -hmm. it just, and in fact, in education and in law, it was meant to exclude. uh, It was meant as power, as a chip that white folks had. These professions, these paths that you and I have taken really historically have always excluded us. And so I could just so relate to that feeling because it's it's kind of a weird feeling. It's for me to have. I'll speak for myself only. It's a weird feeling to be an agent of this this legal system that I know was not created for me, or at least it wasn't created for me to be successful. Like it was created to keep me less than. Mm-hmm. Um, and working within this system to help other folks of color who have been caught in this system where the system is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. So like, and what I'm hearing from you, Katie, is that the system is doing what it's supposed to do as far as folks of color and black people and black women in particular being in the academy. There's so many hurdles that we have to overcome that of course white folks, you know, don't consider hurdles because that's just a thing. It's a checkbox. But for us, it means so many other things. Um, and so it's really affirming to hear to hear you say that as as shitty as it is because, you know, and, and when I talk about like imposter syndrome, I also like to talk about just the imposter experience because I – a lot of time now, like when I come into a place, I do feel like I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm talking about. I'm confident in my abilities and my capabilities, but I feel like you don't know, like you don't expect me to be here. And, and that's a problem. And so it's like, that's how I feel in general with the legal system is that I, I'm not supposed to be here. That's the, the underlying feeling that, I'm trying to work against in my work is that like no folks of color belong in other places besides a prison cell, you know, when we're interacting with the law. There you go. There you go. Um, That's such a great way to put it, right? I feel like the equivalent for me is no one ever expects me to be the professor. When I walk Mm. around my campus, They never, ever expect me to be the professor. Colleagues, 
deans, people I sit in meetings with all the time will still confuse me for a student everywhere that I go. You know, I, I work at Georgia State and it's a predominantly racially minoritized institution. And so most of our students are black and brown students. And so people automatically assume that me walking around campus equals student because mm. I match the student body. I don't match the faculty. Our faculty so, are all still predominantly white. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. So it's <laughs> predominantly white faculty teaching predominantly folks of color students. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's, um, it's an interesting dichotomy. And... I struggle sometimes with how often I have to break down for folks why that in itself is a problem. You know, I struggle with having to break down for people that black and brown students deserve to be taught in a classroom by professors who look like them. That they deserve the opportunity to be taught in a classroom by professors who've had some experiences that mirror their experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and that that in and of itself is such a problem that all of the upper level administrators should be working incredibly hard to rectify this issue at every single opportunity they get. Right. Not because suddenly diversity, equity and inclusion is in style mm -hmm. in a post 2020 mm -hmm. higher education, that they should have been doing that in 2015 and in 2010 and that they should be doing it in 2030 and in 2040. Because surprise, surprise, these problems will still be an issue because white supremacy will still exist. And so for me, it's kind of like wanting to get folks to understand that there's a certain urgency around this, that there is a way in which everybody loses out. All of our students lose out, right? By not having the opportunity to be taught by a more racially diverse group of, of, of faculty. Our white students at predominantly white institutions lose out when they're never taught by anyone who doesn't look like them. It just further fuels white privilege. And it doesn't ever force them to actually have a moment where they consider an academic in a position who does not share their race. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem. And so for me, it's like, I want to name it as a problem both ways. It's a problem for all of our students, irrespective of their race. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little bit tired of hearing people say, well, you know, we, we don't have more faculty of color, particularly Black and Latinx faculty. Um, at an institution like the one that I work at, we have an Asian American population that is proportionate with the number of people of Asian American descent in the country. So it's not considered an area where we need to do vast growth, but the opposite can be said for African-American and Latinx faculty members. And in an institution like where the one I'm at, when I hear leaders, higher ed scholars, university presidents make statements like, we're doing our best to recruit more people of color. We will eventually get there. You know, we just haven't had as many people finish their PhDs. I hear that and it, it drives me crazy because it's inaccurate, first of all, right? The number of incredibly talented people of color scholars that I see all the time in adjunct positions who are being gatekept out right, right. of the more stable positions that they deserve it happens all the time. And so I think that within higher education, we need to spend some time looking inward at the ways in which we actively exclude hmm. um, and start considering how we start making changes across the board um, to address those issues. Yeah, and I think, you know, these are hiring and retention issues that sectors have across the board. And I we hear these same things in the legal field. You know, with we we went to a 
on campus interviews and, you know, there weren't people of color who applied, you know, and it's just like, no, we can't, first of all, we can't shift the blame. We have a responsibility as employers, as the people that hold the power to seek folks out, to do whatever it takes to put the money where it's at. You know, if what we value is a workforce that is representative of our diverse nation, then that's what we need to be doing. Um, Now, if we don't value it, then let's just say that, (laughs) like, let's just come out with it so that then we can know what we're dealing with and we can make decisions to do something else if we want to do something else. Like, let's just call a thing a thing. But that's not what companies are doing. We actually do need to put our money where our mouth is and the resources and the time and give people power to make decisions because sometimes it's, you know, somebody does want to make this higher, but they're not given the authority to be able to do so. Um, Yeah. So what thoughts or suggestions? Well, first, let me ask, where are people going? So what are people doing when they are leaving the academy? Black women. I'm not seeing a pattern in terms of where people are going. I'm Mm -hmm. seeing lots of people finding different routes. Mm -hmm. So I have a colleague who left a while back and started a consulting company and Mm -hmm. who's um, been doing a lot to support other faculty who are choosing to stay Mm -hmm. and helping them navigate tenure and, you know, find success and belonging within the academy. Um, I have a colleague who has taken time to do also consulting, but in a different category, like his moving towards mentoring of graduate students um, and pushing them towards different career paths and opportunities. I've seen this whole growing area, which we call Alt-Ac, Alternatives to Academia. Mm -hmm. Um, And a lot of the new PhD students that I'm seeing are heading in that direction, applied positions as researchers for nonprofits. Okay. They're okay. doing a lot of, yeah, think tanks, the census, the, you know, there, so there's that. Um, and I'm completely torn by this process. <laughs> On the one hand, I want people to find their peace. And then I think about this every day and I'm just like, damn it, if we all leave, then they win. You know, like they don't want us here. I feel like the fact that I show up to work every day pisses people off. And so like, (laughs) yeah, Yeah. why is she still here? We haven't worn her down yet. Um, So part of it, you know, and, and I don't know if that's healthy. Like that doesn't feel like the healthiest mindset because this does wear on your soul. Right. Like, like I just just to keep it real, like it wears on your soul to do this work. But then part of me just like wants to remember how few faculty I connected with when I tried to go to graduate school. And then I think about the research that I do and who does it if people like me don't stay here to do it? You know, I think about where we were 20 years ago when I first became an academic and I was looking through all of the like scholarship for research that was focused on lesbians of Latin American descent. And there was nothing. There was nothing. And I was like, where's the work? Like what, who's, how is no one writing about this? How do we think that lesbians are all white? Is that what's going (laughs) on? Like, do we, are all the lesbians white? Like, what? And I remember how much time I spent justifying my research with statements like, we don't know everything we need to know just from studying white women. Like, if we mm, only study wow. white women, then whiteness continues to be default. And that's a problem. And so I think about that. And uh, I just keep going back to look how far I've pushed, look how much I've been able to do. Like, I don't want to let them have it right now. Like, it feels like losing. (laughs) But it's not. (laughs) It's not. Like, I, and I get you. I do. I really, really do. I've really started thinking about, like, what's my capacity? And have I reached my capacity? I saw a coach, a, um, career coach recently who asked me this question can I continue to do the thing without feeling like it's diminishing my soul yeah that's it 
And so now that's my guiding light. And for me, what that did was it took out the responsibility that I feel like I have to do all the things to make to make this space a better space so that I could just look at myself and how I feel um, when making this decision. Because the answer is always going to be stay and do the work if I'm thinking about other, you know, everybody, if I'm thinking about the bigger mission, because that's, that's the person that I am. And it sounds like that's the person that you might be too. Like that is the mission. That's, that's the goal. Um, but this coach in giving me this question helped me to just take all that other stuff out of the picture and ask about, okay, Whitney, I see that you're passionate. I see that you have passion, but if you continue doing work um, or being in a space or whatever that is beating you down, are you risking that very passion? Yeah. And um, for me, that's just so clarifying. And then the other thing is like, at what point can we pass this off? Um, because this isn't, I'm not God, right? Like I'm not the savior. I'm not the whoever riding in on the horse. And we talk about this a lot when we're talking about like, as a lawyer, when we're talking about the people that we serve, that like, we don't want to be the the shining white knight. I'm not that, I'm not, I don't have that much control. I think that's super valuable for all of us to remember is that like, you can only do so much. Whatever gains you make, you have to weigh that against the cost. The cost to you, right? Because mm-hmm. seriously, I worry about Black women's souls. These yeah. Days, a lot, you know, because everyone I talk to is knee deep in the struggle. It, they're knee deep in fighting to be seen in a white world that will not get it. I'm not going to say can't get it. I'm going to say, you know, I'm not going to say does not get it, will not get it. Like there's a willful intention. Like folks are reclaiming white spaces and they're reclaiming white spaces in ways that are in subtle and very direct ways, making it more and more clear to the rest of us that they're, that um, we've taken up too much room. And so showing up unapologetically every day is a struggle. So before we end, I do want to know what your thoughts are around like solutions. Like, what do you want to Mm -hmm. see in academia? There are endless ways to work on fixing this. Um, None of them are going to be free. And none of them are going to happen without pain. Mm, And discomfort. And discomfort. I mean, I think discomfort is probably a more, is, is the more appropriate word. It's not going to be free and it's not going to be comfortable because that's not what's happening here, right? And so partly what I keep trying to bring home to folks is if we're going to create an environment that offers more equity for Black and brown people, particularly for Black women, then other folks need to move over. People need to let go of some of their privilege. That means that you actually have to say, (laughs) it's not my turn anymore. And at a basic level, you know how we teach kindergartners and we all take turns and it's not your turn and you have to wait. Like, I want to really go back to some of my colleagues and be like, let's relearn that lesson because somehow you've decided that, you know, (laughs) In theory, you believe and support the goals of equity. And in theory, you believe and support the notion that like we need to do a better job of recruiting and retaining uh, faculty members of color at these institutions. But when that actually means that there's less space and less opportunity for you to continue to do your whiteness, then suddenly... Mm -hmm. suddenly the conversation changes. 
Right. It's like when you got to put skin in the game, then it's like, ooh, well, but what I meant was. Yeah. And and I don't, you know, I used to have some empathy for that. And I, I have to be honest, I'm very quickly beginning to lose that empathy because when I hear people have that kind of uh, moments of hesitation, what I'm hearing them say is that their soul and their health matters more Mm -hmm. than mine. Mm -hmm. What I'm hearing them say is that they're going to protect their peace at the expense of mine. Yeah. And so then, then I start to have some real problems with that, right? Yeah, that's very, and it's very personal. Like this is a personal thing in terms of this affects like a real person, these policies that we're talking about and the the procedures and the the ways, the unspoken rules and the norms, all of this stuff affects real people. Mm -hmm. Like it affects me when you decide that you're not going to do X, Y, or Z or that you don't want to change X, Y, or Z policy. Like that, it affects me. And it, I mean, yeah, that's, this is kind of related, but this is similar to like when people would say that they, you know, supported Trump, but they weren't racist. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it though? Like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then you just kind of yeah. have to look at them like, oh. Uh. So I don't know where that puts you and I then, because like this person is actively trying to harm me. Uh, so, yeah. so I can't work with that. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. Um, and yeah, I mean, I look at higher ed, and I'm, and I, I, I just. I'm demoralized at some of the barriers and obstacles that have been put in the way. A lot of them legal barriers and obstacles that I don't even know what, what how to begin to work with this. Every time we're on a search committee and we're hiring, there's always this conversation about can we talk about the race of the candidate and can we, you know, can we say that we want to hire a person of color for this position, that we want to prioritize hiring a person of color for this position. I mean, we we get clear instructions that we're absolutely not allowed to do this, that we're supposed to create this environment where everybody gets valued equally and where the best candidate rises to the top naturally. And then we're going to teach people about racial bias and hope that they will recognize the racial bias and still allow faculty members of color to rise to the top of the pool despite their own bias. That's how we do things around here. And I struggle with it all the time because it goes against everything I know about white supremacy, which is if you don't intentionally create the corrective, you just reproduce it over and over again. That's what white supremacy is. Right. You got to actively do the thing. If you don't do Shit, shit won't happen. Like what? I keep getting stuck in this loop where people are like, well, you know, legally we can't do this and legally we can't do that. And and like and I'm looking at the laws and I'm like, yeah, but they were designed and created in order to continue to protect white supremacy. And right. so when you tell me what the law says, yeah, I know what the law says. I'm not an idiot. I can read it. I can understand it. But also like I'm not going to respect it. Like I'm not going to sit here and choose that to be the way that I guide how I think about our hiring process when I know that we're in a situation where that's not the corrective. It's not the solution. We have to be able to find ways to unapologetically be able to promote and recruit what we want to see on our campus. Yeah. Colorblind ideology isn't going to do it. Mm -mm. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining me today on Impostrix Podcast, Katie. Um, Can you tell us about your podcast so that we can listen in? Um, and where we can find you. Thank you so much for that. Um, Yes, I started a podcast this past year, Intersectionality in the American South. And the goal of the podcast is really to center the experiences of BIPOC individuals in the South. You know, I'm a sociologist, so I'm looking at the ways in which larger structural issues, um, issues in education, 
mass incarceration, reproductive rights, are infringing upon Black and brown folks, and particularly how they're being adversely affected, and also how they're finding ways to create resilience, um, doing a lot of interviews with activists and people Mm -hmm. who are working in different fields. And I'm just trying to better understand that experience and put it out there in the world for all of us. Well, I'm a listener and I enjoy the podcast and I appreciate you for for that work, for what you add, what you bring to to the academy, but also to my life. I see you and I appreciate you. Thank you so, so very much. And it's been an honor to be your guest today. Thank you. All right, y'all. We talked about a lot of things and, you know, really we're talking about how we can Make sure that what we're doing in our professional lives is not diminishing our passion. And so that's the question that I want y'all to think about this week as you go on with your lives. Um, Are you living and are you able to work in an environment where you can feel like you're safe and your soul is safe and you're not being diminished? Let me know what y'all come up with. Until next time. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you liked what you heard, don't forget to listen to past episodes and to subscribe. Also, feel free to leave me a message. I want to know what you think about this show. So you can do that by leaving a review or you can do that by sending me an email at imposterixpodcast at gmail.com. This podcast is for me and this podcast is for you. And I hope that you're leaving this podcast and this experience feeling validated because that's that's the goal. Be validated. Until next time.